Hello, my name is Larry Lapidus. I'm currently Vice President of Worldwide Sales for Empiris. In 1999, I joined uh, Pericity in that same position, Vice President of Worldwide Sales. 2021 is now the 25th anniversary of the founding of Pericity and the introduction of the Specman product. So uh, I thought that a uh, look back to uh, uh, the beginnings of, of Specman and, and to some degree the beginnings of modern uh, verification methodology would be an interesting thing to do, as well as having a look at what's going on right now. Joining me today are two people that were involved then, uh, were early users of Specman and are still currently uh, working actively in the verification industry, Brian Dickman and Sean Smith. Perhaps, Brian, you'd like to introduce yourself, what you were doing then and what you're doing now. Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, I mean, you're really making me feel old, inviting me to something that happened 25 years ago. <laughs> That's not great. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a career verification guy. Um, I do remember 25 years ago and, and how things were then. Um, I, I started out actually working on mainframe um, hardware design uh, many years ago. And then I, I took up a job with a small startup in Cambridge, um, which turned out to be a good decision. Um, so I've really I'd been an, an arm lifer up until a couple of years ago. So I spent 23 years with arm in Cambridge. Um, played various leadership roles during that time. Uh, I remember bringing in many different verification technologies, constrained random, of course, uh, but, you know, formal hardware acceleration, everything. Um, and then since I uh, left ARM a couple of years ago um, and decided I wanted to um, take some time out and be an independent, uh, at this stage of my career. So I started up Bulletit Consulting and really been enjoying that. Um, and, you know, it's still a very rich and interesting, seems like a crazy thing to be saying for a DVCon audience, but, you know, verification is still a really rich and interesting area, as we know. There's loads of innovation going on. Um, more recently, I've been working with um, another sort of ex-colleague from ARM, um, Joe Conby, He's another uh, independent uh, and we've, we've had several clients uh, recently and we've also been putting a few articles together around the theme of bugs. Um, so, you know, insights into the whole aspect of bugs. Uh, we plan to do a bit more on that. Okay. And Sean, perhaps you'd care to introduce uh, yourself and what you were doing then and now. Okay. Um, my name is Sean Smith, and I am another uh, career verification person. It's always been something I've enjoyed. Um, I started my career at, at IBM working on video and then networking chips, and uh, ended up at Cisco shortly thereafter as they were trying to integrate IBM technologies into their router products. And um, that's when I first really uh, came across Specman. Um, since then, I have been you know, doing verification. I've worked in EDA, I've done some RTL and ASIC and board designs, but I, I always find myself coming back to verification because it's just something that I've always enjoyed. I like the, the software aspects of it and, and the challenge. Uh, most recently, I've worked at a couple of microprocessor startups, uh, soft machines, who got acquired by Intel and then worked on some AI stuff at Intel for a bit. And most recently, I am uh, validating chips at a company called Esperanto Technologies. We are just came out of stealth mode and we are trying to build very large AI coprocessors using uh, RISC-V instruction sets and so on. And uh, so I'm kind of Although I've kind of migrated from different roles throughout the years, I'm, I'm most last five years I've kind of been back to where I started, and uh, it is kind of interesting to see these things, how some things have changed and how some things have evolved over the last twenty-five years. And uh, I look forward to discussing it with you guys today. Yeah. So, so Sean, maybe you could uh, say a little bit more about how you first encountered. Uh, Specman and and how uh, how you and uh, and Cisco made the 
decision to go with uh, this uh, this new tool? So um, yeah, it was it was kind of early on, um, well, maybe two three years into Cisco. Um, some of our senior architects had really had been noticing what was going on in the GPU world or in kind of in the general area of application specific processors. And they had this idea, it's like, well, if they can build a graphics processor, why can't we build a network processor? And so we kind of uh, set out to do a, a Skunk Works effort to see if we could actually pull this off. And I knew from my previous experience of trying to write benches in Verilog that we were just so bogged down by the limitations of A of Vera or Verilog as a programming language. I mean, remember, Verilog doesn't have fancy data structures, or even, you know, back then it didn't even have a re-entrance, which was probably the biggest thing that used to drive us nuts. But stimulus creation was a huge challenge. Uh, writing checkers was a huge challenge. Temporal verification was a huge challenge. And we knew that, you know, going into the Skunk Works effort, they wanted us to pull a chip off and fab it and have it in the lab in like eight months. And so we knew we needed to do something differently. I knew we needed to do something differently. And I was tapped to lead this effort. And so I, I just started looking around. The great thing about Cisco is Cisco had a great verification community. Even back then, we had a company-wide, worldwide mailing list where people were discussing. So I started looking at what people were doing. And folks out in California had a little ahead of me had played with Vera and had started applying that on chips and also applying Specment. So um, I was fortunate enough to kind of have some of their leadership there. Um, you know, how we got connected into Specman is one of our verification managers, uh, Inat Yogev, I believe, uh, knew Yoav from college or somewhere back in, in Israel. And so we, we started looking at, at both these technologies, both Vera and Specman and you know quickly saw the power of of what was available i mean I, as i said i'd been struggling on these last projects you know creating stimulus was a both monotonous and you know it was just we were stuttering and lacking the tools we needed and uh, as soon as we started seeing what we could do with constrained random it became very obvious that this was the future uh, a better programming language solved a lot of our other problems coverage to enable to measure how how a randomness was working and then you know this was the first time i'd ever seen a temporal expression language you know now we all take for granted system verilog assertions and things like that but e you know 25 years ago had temporal e in there which allowed you to write very interesting temporal checkers that you know none of which was really feasible before it was a bit of a game changer wasn't it yeah it truly was yeah, yeah. And at, at ARM, how did uh, how did you guys get into uh, changing Never changing right. your methodology? Yeah, it's not really curious to Sean, really. I mean, I think uh, if you think about you know complexity issue and how that has evolved over the last twenty five years. Twenty five years ago, you know, we were talking about much simpler microprocessors, right? You know, three stage, five stage pipelines. There was no cache coherency. Uh, generally, no out of order execution. You know, we're talking about much, much simpler architectures and micro architectures. So, to be honest, a lot of the the methodology was really based on top level. You know, run, running programs on the core was the most pragmatic way of of running a lot of verification. And I think, you know, the advent of um, these constrained random methodologies, like Speckman and, and Vera at the time really it was a game changer it really opened up the ability to do some proper you know hierarchical top-down verification and we had to do it because i think you know the complexity was increasing rapidly around about that time and you know you had to do that to keep up so i think that's you know that's what really drove that initial adoption it, i mean it was I wouldn't say it was straightforward to just adopt this new kind of way of thinking. Um, it was a bit of a paradigm shift, and it did mean people needed to think differently about how to architect test benches and stuff. Um, and initially we thought, oh, hey, this is a load of extra work uh, we've got to do as verification engineers. We've got to write a whole load of you know, uh, constraints and functional coverage and analyze cross coverage. 
but you know, you it, it was the way to find the bugs. So that was that yeah, was our yeah. The complexity thing was um, was interesting because at the beginning of that decade in the early nineties, we saw uh, synopsis come on with synthesis uh, and synthesis start becoming mainstream and that enabled a significant rise in in chip complexity uh, but until uh, Vera and uh, Specman came along there wasn't a corresponding uh, increase in capability on the verification side yeah and so uh, I, I think there was uh, what, what people were seeing was real problems in getting first silicon uh, correct uh, at that time yeah, yeah. So, you, I mean, Sean, you mentioned Yoav, and the thing I remember about Yoav and his his team was just, you know, how super smart those guys were um, at the time. And I thought, actually, I think they know more about my problem than I do. <laughs> they understood the problem better <laughs> than we did. So I think we learned a lot, actually, in those early days. Absolutely. They they were certainly ahead of well, where I was at the time. And, uh, you know, I was just very, very glad to be able to meet them and, and be part of that and get to apply it and, and watch it work. Yeah. 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 So two, two of the key pieces that um, uh, Specman had were the constrained random uh, generation, uh, the, the ability to throw some interesting stimulus, but also the uh, functional coverage uh, was one of those um, more important than the other in terms of uh, propagating the usage, or was it just a complete methodology for using those together? I, I, I think the two go together. I think they they were equally important in my view. I don't know what you thought, Sean. I, I, I've always thought that they were equally important, um, but I, I would, if you look at the broader teams of what people use, maybe beyond my opinion, I would say that constrained random kind of led the effort. And because a lot of people at first, you know, they were like, all right, great, now I can get all the stimulus. But they didn't have the realize until they used it for a while that coverage was really the necessary evil to go along with it, to help you measure where you were going and, you know, help validate your progress. So I think we, I, we saw more of a bit of a staged approach where, okay, everyone went crazy with random and then realized, okay, we can just sit there and generate vectors forever. We really need to focus in on what's important and that's when the functional coverage started taking off so i would say that in our, our organization there was probably a lag of maybe a project before we really understood what we needed to use functional coverage for yeah i think that's probably true yeah that that's that's interesting because it uh, uh, you know corresponds exactly with what uh, what we were seeing from uh, from our perspective of talking with customers the constrained random was relatively intuitive uh, because it was just another method of generating stimulus and everybody has written their own stimulus. And so that, that's pretty good. Um, and and that, was, that was the foot in the door. That was how people got started. Uh, mm. But the functional coverage was how, how it propagated uh, because that gave the metrics for actually uh, proving that uh, the things were going well. There was an interesting uh, paper given uh, maybe around 2001, 2002 by Kai at Intel uh, in Israel, uh, Akiva, um, and showed that uh, uh, functional coverage was actually uh, effectively a proxy variable for bugs found. And, and uh, we, we went around for a few years showing this wonderful graph of uh, functional coverage uh, going up and bugs found going down. Oh. I think it also led to a, more of a philosophy of, you know, feature driven test planning, didn't it? Because you, you have to kind of think about the scenarios and the features that you want to stimulate and to test and write those down. Uh, you know, whereas before you might have just think, well, I'm going to run a bunch of tests that randomly stimulate this and see what pops out. Yeah, there there were a few things as um, as customers started using this more. Um, there there was a uh, more uh, disciplined and, and documented uh, reuse methodology that was brought on, which 
um, has now evolved into UPM and, and then um, the actual thought of verification planning and verification management. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting to think that this was 25 years ago, that it, 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 it doesn't seem that long ago to me, but um, <laughs> you know, that a lot yeah. has happened in that time. And I think, uh, did I read that UVM is now 10 years old? So, you know, a lot of these things are really yes. well established and accepted methodologies now. Um, I, I think what's interesting is if you start to think about, you know, maybe what some of the unintended consequences or the unexpected consequences of this new movement towards constraint random testing have been is the, you know, the scale out and the growth in just the amount of compute and cluster that you that projects are now consuming to do verification and i think that's an interesting thing to, to think about yeah so so as verification has uh, has evolved um you know there there were different um there was an evolutionary path from uh, the e reuse methodology to uh, upm and then upm being uh, established, but now here we are, and uh, companies have these large compute farms or are now moving to uh, to cloud-based uh, computing for verification. Um, is is there? Um, well, may, maybe just asking, uh, you know, where we are right now. What what are the what are the key uh, verification issues that are on the table for today's uh, SOCs? You want to take that, Sean? Uh, All right. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's verification is very weird. I mean, you know, many things stay the same. Many things change. What's still the same in verification? Well, complexity and size. You know, we thought they were out of control 20 years ago. Well, guess what? You know, the sky's the limit these days with modern manufacturing processes. You can, we can just fit so much silicon. So. To me, you know, the, the biggest challenge that we still face today is capacity. I mean, I, I just finished validating a huge subsystem on a chip, and this subsystem was bigger than an SOC just five years ago. And, and, and you know, it's just become crazy. And so all these mainstay techniques um, have, you know, be, be tried and true, and they work, and they are still workhorses. But one of the biggest challenges that you know that we face besides some of them, I'll talk about some other ones is, is still capacity because I can't simulate full chip sims and get the coverage that I need to these days. Um, even with RTL simulation, with all the optimizations that we can throw at it, every trick in the book that we have, full chip verification is no longer the mainstay. And um, the, the, the big challenge now is this has all moved into hardware emulation. And why? Because A, the chips are bigger, but the other big thing that's, well, that's different, it's not the same, is many years ago, the, the software components to the chips that we did were much smaller. Maybe not from an ARM perspective, but from the types of chips we built, maybe not having any processors in, in them at all to now building chips with a thousand plus microprocessors. From a verification point of view, um you know i think you've you've still got this problem on completeness how do you decide nothing that you do is complete so how do you decide that you know you're going to sign off and you've you've done enough um to, to get the product out um and and then you've got all these other interesting aspects that are coming in more and more like security is a is a big piece of the puzzle now um functional we just mentioned automotive so you know functional safety is another major area. So there's a, a different approach that you've maybe got to take to your verification um, to wring out the bugs in those areas as well. So there's still lots and lots of challenges. I think, yeah, I mean, sure, you talk about capacity in terms of, you know, I guess billion gate designs or multi-billion gate designs, and that that's a big challenge. Um, but then as we also said, you know, scaling out um, just to uh, you know, can scan out your computer state uh, to give you enough capacity to run all of these cycles, um, or your hardware acceleration state, maybe. Um, or you know, there's, there's got to be a limit to that where the ROI starts to get eroded. 
And I think, you know, what we what verification has got to do is try and figure out how to be smarter, actually. So how do I, you know, do more with less um, and actually be a lot smarter? How am I running a lot of dumb cycles uh, when, in fact, I could be running much more targeted and faster cycles? I only want to run the cycles that find the bugs in reality. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know where the bugs are. So my view on this is that this is where my passion actually is. This is where data and big data can really play a big role in this. You know, we all know over the years, verification generates a ton of data. Um, and if you can exploit that data through, you know, just even basic visualization analytics is a starting point. But if you can apply some machine learning and some data science to that problem as well, I honestly think the, there are massive opportunities to um, change the way that verification is done by exploiting all of that good data. And I think our verification engineers, you know, they're already uh, multi-skilled discipline guys, aren't they? Because they're hardware guys and they're also software guys, particularly when you think about, you know, the whole Speckman and Vera approach, you know, really was much more of a software orientated way of writing your test bench. Um, but I think they're also becoming data analysts and data scientists and verification probably needs to, you know, uh, uh, adopt a lot of that, those da good data science practices, in my view. You mentioned, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, security and uh, safety, uh, but are, are there additional things? So, so Sean, you've been working on these large uh, arrays of uh, processors on the SOC, is there, um, is there any, um, any new techniques that uh, um, uh, that that have been developed, or or you know, as, as we look at these uh, maybe more domain specific uh, SOCs and domain specific processors, are there new techniques uh, that are needed on the verification side to make things more efficient? But clear, clearly, I mean, there there are needs for doing things smarter, as Brian says. Um, it's just the scale and it, the complexity has has gone off the roof. And yes, I mean, without getting into the secrets, uh, uh, trade secrets, there are, there are certainly things that are changing with respect to having fault tolerant systems and the requirements for that. And that certainly impacts what we what we do on the verification side of things. And um, yeah, there, there's continuing. I mean, the one probably the biggest thing for me, you know, this is probably old news coming from folks like Arm, but the, the amount of effort required today in low power verification. Um, there's a there's a lot of work there that, you know, in, in the older days at places like Cisco and Juniper, those really weren't concerned. You know, on these modern SOCs, you got a thousand processors. Power is, is a huge problem. And, you know, how do you validate this, not just from a hardware perspective, but from a system and application perspective, which is goes back to this, you really need a whole software stack and be able to execute software stacks, whether it be on a, you know, a virtual platform like you guys at Imperis provide or RTL or emulation to really flesh out these types of system level issues that we're dealing with these days. Yeah, totally agree with that. Power is a massive challenge. Very complex. Yeah. What, what about going down to the the individual processor? So one, one of the things that's been going on in uh, in the overall semiconductor industry over the last few years has been the um, the advent of uh, of RISC V and this new instruction set architecture. And uh, what what we've seen at, at Empiris is, is that. Oh, this is this is great, but now you've got to implement this as RTL. And uh, while uh, ARM and uh, MIPS and and other processor IP companies have been doing this for a long time, I, actually the sort of publicly available industry knowledge on processor uh, verification has uh, disappeared from view, and it's being reinvented a bit. Um, is that just is that just another aspect of uh, of verification, another another specific niche like uh, like safety and security and and low power, are there different things that go on with uh, with processor verification? 
Well, one of the things there, for example, uh, Arm used to uh, say publicly, Brian, and, and uh, you, you know, you may be limited in what you can say, but they would uh, claim something like 10 to the 15th um, uh, verification cycles uh, per uh, processor, which actually uh, is somewhere around 10,000 RTL simulators running continuously uh, for one year straight. Right. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you know, ARM would have invested massive amounts in verification over the years. You know, there's a huge, <laughs> uh, huge team of guys, really. Yeah, you know, I would say this coming from ARM, wouldn't I? But, you know, they really are at the top of the game in terms of verification. And I think, you know, the challenge for uh, Risk Five is, you know, you've got some smaller teams coming up. Um, and you know how much of that do they have to replicate to push out a, a new processor core? And I, th I think the risk five processors are probably starting down at the more um, the less complex end in terms of processors, but I think they're trending they're trending upwards. You know, I think I, I think I've seen there are some out of order cores now in the risk five lineup from some of the companies. So I think I think it's the same. I think all the same rules apply um you know and um the, the complexity the difficulty of the problem is the same I, I agree with brian completely on this um i don't think there's really anything unique about quote risk five versus arm versus mips from a tactical standpoint that changes verification but what does create challenges is arm did a brilliant job of enabling an entire ecosystem around their processors um, you know, whether it be random instruction generators, ISSs, VIPs for bus protocols, et cetera. So the, the risk five movement is kind of going through these same pains right now. And they've learned from the 25 years of experience, but the ecosystem is not as rich yet. And, you know, thankfully, companies like Imperis are off trying to create virtual platforms. You got folks like Valtrix trying to create random instruction generators and people are, you know, starting to put together VIPs and other components that you really need to build a whole system around these things. And so uh, really, I just see risk five kind of just going through some of the similar growing pains that ARM did at the moment. It's just it's happening in a, in a very accelerated pace with the, you know, the sheer interest coming around from the world. And there's, there, you know, this is kind of the first time it, that we've seen a lot of more open source cooperation in hardware. We know open source is a huge thing in software, but the chip industry, you know, has largely resisted that for the last 25 years. And that is something I think, I think that is changing a little bit more with risk five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. So, so I think we're about at the end of, uh, of our time uh, here. So uh, I, uh, I'd like to thank you both, and uh, I'm not sure if you have any last comments you'd like to make about uh, uh, 25 years of uh, veracity, 25 years of, uh, of advanced uh, verification. Yeah, I think one one thing that you mentioned, uh, somebody mentioned earlier, was the was the whole cloud um, thing. I don't think we really talked about that too much. I know we're out of time now, but um, I, I think that's a, another interesting area, isn't it? Whereas um, you know, people are starting to migrate from on-prem to cloud. Um, and I know the EDA industry is really tackling this problem at the moment, moving workflows to cloud, optimizing stuff for cloud. Um, be interesting, I think, with the Risk Five community to see how many people go straight to cloud because they're, you know, they're probably smaller companies in general um, and don't have a large on-prem investment. Um, but that's another, you know, it's another interesting trend that's definitely occurring is this whole move to the cloud. I think that's unstoppable. I agree. Yeah. I, I think the, the one thing I'll leave us with is it, I'm just still perplexed to this day that these novel concepts that we started using 25 years ago have found such broad agreement across our, you know, our, our industry and that they are used pretty much ubiquitously everywhere. And whether it be constrained random coverage or even the, the, the evolution of ERM into UVM, it's just, uh, it's still very impressive and, and kind of mind boggling to me that, you know, this little effort from from Yoav and these guys really did reshape verification as we know it. 
I, I think as we said at the beginning, it was a game changer, wasn't it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, it, it, it was uh, it was interesting uh, being in Perusity and and being a part of that and and uh, seeing it and and you two, um, you know, you, you two individually and your companies were uh, a significant part of that. You were part of the core group of, of customers that we used to help uh, define the uh, uh, the path that we were taking the product and, and the methodology uh, down and, and uh, you know th thanks thanks for your efforts then um, and yeah it's paid off we're still using uh, this stuff and and uh, thank you uh, for spending the time uh, with me now this has been uh, this has been a lot of fun to uh, chat about verification and uh, go back 25 years, but also talk about the interesting things that we've got right now. Thanks, Larry. Thank you, Thank you Larry. Equally, equally pleasurable. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.